Hello and welcome back to my channel, Something Wicked. My name is Jacqueline and before we get started today, I would like to warn you that this case surrounds the death of a child and refers to other cases that also deal with the death of children. This case also contains graphic imagery um, of a deceased child as well. If this is not something you are comfortable with, then I will see you in the next video. The Boy in the Box case, also known as the America's Unknown Child case, is an unsolved mystery about a boy murdered in the 1950s in Philadelphia and is full of conjecture and mystery. In this video, you will hear all about the theories and false leads that kept detectives awake at night for years. The majority of my research is taken from the book The Boy in the Box, The Unsolved Case of America's Unknown Child, written by David Stout and all quotes I use in this video are taken from this book. Without further ado, let's get started. Frederick Benosis was driving home after attending classes at LaSalle College in Fox Chase, Pennsylvania on Monday, February 25th, 1957, when he saw a rabbit dart across the road and run into the underbrush. Susquehanna Road was a long, uninhabited road that stretched through farmland and was sandwiched by fields on either side. Upon seeing the rabbit, Frederick pulled his car over to the side got out and tried to sneak up on him to see how close he could get before it became spooked, a game he liked to play when the opportunity arose. Um, this guy must have been hella bored. Just two days earlier, driving the same route home, Frederick saw the rabbit then too. And just the same, he pulled his car over and tried to sneak up on it. He didn't find the rabbit, but he did find steel traps in the bush. Frederick loved animals and would never hurt one. He hated trappers. So when he saw the traps, he found a large stick and used it to set them off. On the day of February 25th, after following the rabbit into the woods, Frederick decided to check the traps again to see if they had been reset. They hadn't been. His happiness was short-lived, however, as Frederick looked around the woods. He was frustrated to see people were using it as their own dumping ground. There were cans, car batteries, and an old chair with its innards popping out discarded everywhere. There was also a large cardboard box, about three feet long, partially covered by vegetation lying on its side. Inside the box, Frederick saw a large doll. Hmm, odd, he thought. It was very big for a doll. But it only took Frederick a moment to realize what he was actually staring at. It wasn't a doll in the box, but the body of a little boy. The hair was very fine, and the skin wasn't the exaggerated pink of a doll, but whiter, with greening around the stomach. Frederick ran back to his car and drove away. He wished he had never been here that day to see the rabbit and never chased after it into the woods. The following day, Frederick still hadn't told police about what he had found, and he didn't plan on telling them. He wanted nothing to do with the police. The truth was, Frederick hadn't only been driving down Susquehanna Road as a means to get home. There was, in fact, an all-girls school located across the street and down the road from where the boy in the box was found. And Frederick, being a young man in his early 20s, liked to try and get glimpses of the girls on the school grounds from within the surrounding bush. The police had actually confronted him about this and handed out a warning for him to stay away from the premise. So no, Frederick was not going to tell the police about what he found in the box. At least at first. Driving to class the next day, Frederick heard on the radio that, quote, Police in southern New Jersey are searching for a four-year-old girl missing from her home in Bellomar. Could the body in the box have been a girl and not a boy as he had originally believed? Was that the missing child? He didn't get a good look after all. Guilt-ridden, Frederick skipped class that day and drove straight to talk to his brother, who was also a priest, and he told him everything. After speaking with his brother, Frederick called the police and soon everyone in Pennsylvania would know about the boy in the box. Now, as if this isn't unbelievable enough, it gets worse. An unidentified trapper called William, not his real name, biked down Susquehanna Road to meet some friends for a game of basketball at a local church gymnasium. 
It was on a Saturday, the 23rd of February, and it was cold outside. But despite the cold, the route to the gymnasium passed by the patch of woods where he kept a large amount of muskrat traps, and he decided to stop along the way to check if he had caught anything. He got off his bike, left it by the side of the road, and walked a short distance into the woods. He, too, was disgusted by all the trash he saw discarded there. Tin cans, an old hot water heater, the throne of a toilet. Why were people such pigs? As he moved a little deeper inward, he noticed a large cardboard box on its side. He was familiar with the trash in the area from constantly checking his traps, but this box was new and it hadn't been there the last time he had checked. He knew it had to have been recently disposed of as it hadn't yet succumbed to the winter elements. Will was naturally curious, and he couldn't resist seeing what was inside. As he reached to grab the box, he felt it was quite heavy, and he let it go to walk around and peer in the front. He was surprised to see a large doll in the box, partially wrapped in a patterned blanket, and thought it was odd that someone would dispose of it seeing as it probably cost a lot of money. But as he peered closer, Will was overcome with sadness and the cold of the winter became, in that moment, very evident on his skin. Will ran back to his bike and rode home as fast as he could. Will was 18 years old and had moved to America eight years earlier from Poland with his family during the war. Their family had seen their homeland destroyed and watched their friends and neighbors being taken away by Nazis. This led to Will having a strong distrust for authority. He believed that men in uniform should be avoided, or they would take away what he loved. Not wanting the police to confiscate his muskrat traps, Will kept his findings to himself, and when he got home, he went straight to his room. He was afraid of what he saw in the woods, but if he didn't tell anyone, then no one in uniform would come and talk to him. After Frederick Benosis's call to the police, Elmer Palmer was the first to arrive to investigate the scene on a cold, drizzly morning. Elmer was in his late 20s, married with two children, a little boy and a little girl, and this case hit him hard as in the presence of the boy in the box, he thought of his own children. When Palmer approached the box, he felt a wave of melancholy sweep over him. It definitely wasn't a doll. The boy was partially wrapped in a rust and green colored blanket, and at first glance, one could only see his head and upper torso. His arms were folded across his chest and he had bruises all up and down his body, but predominantly on his head. Also, a peculiar observation. The boy had recently had his hair cut, as large chunks of it were still clinging to his body. The boy appeared to be about four or five years old. Elmer was shortly met by another officer named Sam Weinstein, who was older than Elmer and higher in rank than he was, a captain in fact. Sam had been doing this a long time, but he had never seen a murdered child before. Sam had served with the Marines during World War II, but also being a father and husband, seeing the murdered boy was a sight that stayed with him for the rest of his life. The men noted the boy's expression, quote, the mouth looked as though the child had been crying or been about to cry when his life had stopped. Had this child died in sadness and shame and fear? Both men agreed that whoever had done this deserved to burn in hell, or at least the electric chair. But there was a hint of optimism to be found in the state of the child. His face, although bruised, was still entirely recognizable, and if the paper were to run photos, then surely someone would identify him and the case could be solved quickly. After all, this was a little boy. Certainly someone was looking for him. The boy was taken to the morgue located at 13th and Wood Street where an autopsy could be performed. Anyone else find it cliche to have a morgue on 13th Street? Dr. Spellman was the medical examiner who performed the autopsy. Please note, this next section contains graphic details about the boy in the box and may not be for everyone. So if this isn't for you or if you're not in the right headspace to hear this right now, please skip ahead to the timestamp. Starting with the boy's weight and height, Dr. Spellman noticed that the boy appeared very malnourished. At just over 40 centimeters or 3.3 feet tall, the boy weighed 30 pounds and to the doctor looked as if he, quote, had gone hungry most of the time or been sick a lot or both. The boy had many bruises spanning his whole body, predominantly on his face and head. 
Dr. Spellman noted that these were not the bruises that kids would get just from playing outside or roughhousing around with friends. They were deep and the majority of them had been inflicted at the same time, indicating they stemmed from a primary incident. After Dr. Spellman found a nasty wound on the back of the boy's head, he suspected the boy had been beaten to death. And the child was indeed a boy, not a girl, as Frederick Winosis had wondered after hearing the radio broadcast, proven by his circumcision. There was an evident pattern to the bruising on the boy as well. They appeared to be finger and thumb imprints. Given the boy's hair had been recently cut, the doctor pondered a scenario in his head. What if perhaps the boy would not sit still during a haircut and the parent or guardian got angry and lost control? Although this scenario was possible, it was a little far-fetched as the cut hairs clung to the boy's skin, indicating the boy was naked when his hair was cut. Perhaps the boy had been getting his hair cut in the bath. This scenario would also help explain another odd finding about the boy. Both soles of his feet and his right hand only had wrinkled skin, similar to the washerwoman effect that one gets when they stay in the bath too long. Dr. Spellman noted the wrinkled effect on the boy would have been caused by prolonged periods submerged in water, longer than that of a typical bath. Was the boy told to sit and stay in the bath as some kind of punishment? Dr. Spellman ran the theory through his head again. What if the boy had been getting a haircut in the bath and was misbehaving? The parent or guardian lost their temper and yanked the boy out of the tub, beat and slapped him and flung him back into the tub with the boy hitting the back of his head on the faucet, killing him. After the adult calms down, it is too late, and they leave the bathroom to sit and have a wine or whiskey in disbelief, wondering what to do. The adult goes back to the tub and cradles the boy out of the water. Meanwhile, the wet cut hair clings to his body and the adult wraps him in a rust and green pattern blanket before driving out to Susquehanna Road. This was, however, just a theory. Other details the doctor found on the boy were three small scars, one on the chest, one on the groin, and one on the left ankle. The ones on the chest and groin were identified as surgical incisions, while the scar on the left ankle was due to a cut made to expose a vein for blood transfusion or infusion. This was a promising lead, as it indicated the boy may have had surgery, and there would be a record of the procedures done. The boy still had his tonsils and all of his baby teeth and was determined to be under six years old. There were other scars on the boy's body, but they were non-surgical and irregular in shape. One on the left side of his chest, the left elbow, and on his chin. The boy also had several moles on his body. Interestingly enough, the boy's fingernails and toenails had been cut recently, short and neat which is a juxtaposing find amongst the bruises and showed he had been cared for. Of note was the fact that the boy's eyebrows appeared to have been styled. This fact is not specified, but I assume it means either that his brows had been slicked up and shaped or potentially even plucked. The boy had not been given any vaccinations. Rape was ruled out and this was a relieving find, especially given everything else the boy must have gone through. At least rape was not one of them. And x-rays proved the boy had no broken bones. When the doctor examined the gastrointestinal tract, it showed the boy had not eaten a couple hours prior to his death, yet a dark brown residue was found in his esophagus consistent with vomiting. When illuminated under an ultraviolet light, the boy's left eye shone a lemon yellow color. This was believed to indicate that the boy may have had chronic eye disease and a special diagnostic dye was applied. This was also a good sign as the eye doctor that treated the boy would surely remember treating him. Many years later when the case was being revisited and medical intelligence was advancing, it was determined that the yellow color in the eye could have also been caused by a disease itself rather than the treatment. This disease was known to sometimes be fatal to children, but if the boy died from a disease, why all the bruises and trauma to his head? One big issue in the case was the weather. It was February in Pennsylvania and very cold out, thus slowing the decomposition rate of anything exposed to the elements. As the boy's body was found naked in an open box outside, his time of death could be greatly skewed. 
Although Dr. Spellman believed time of death was a few days before police found him, that number could be off by many. If all other methods of identification failed, the intact face, the surgical scars, the yellow eye, there was still hope for the feet. See, all hospitals were required to take footprints of babies after birth, and if the prints taken upon death matched ones in the hospital records, an identity would be made. But sadly, no such match was ever found. Wilton Krogman, a professor of physical anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania and a nationally recognized expert in child growth and development, looked over the boy and concluded that he was likely of Northwest European ancestry from his, quote, long, narrow head and high, narrow face. Wilton believed either from England, Scotland, Germany, or Scandinavia. Now we will talk about the crime scene and some of the clues found at it. There were several clues at the scene of the crime that led detectives to believe this case could be solved quickly. First and most importantly was the box itself the boy was found in. It showed some weathering due to the elements and was damp on the outside, but all in all, well maintained. The inside was still dry. They suspected that it had been outside for only a couple of days. There was a shipping label on the box still, and it showed that the box had originated in Peru, Indiana, and was shipped to a J.C. Penney store in Upper Darby, Delaware, which is just west of Philadelphia. When the box had shipped, it held a baby bassinet and was only one of 12 that the store received on November 27, 1956. It was sold between the 3rd of December, 1956 to February 16, 1957, so only a week or so before the boy was first seen in the woods by William the Trapper. Each bassinet sold for $7.50 at the time. Unfortunately, there was no way to track down the buyer for the bassinet as, at the time, the store operated only in cash. No Apple Pay here yet. Inside the box, traces of white paint had been found, but sadly no fingerprints. It was believed that the bassinet had been painted white either just before being placed in the box or while still inside it. Over the weeks of the investigation, detectives had managed to track down 11 out of the 12 buyers of the bassinet and ruled out any connection to the boy in the box. The owner of the 12th bassinet was never found to this day, and it is impossible not to wonder if that one buyer could have been the key to this whole puzzle. The blanket found with the boy was a rust and green pattern and was determined to have been washed recently. The blanket had been cut into two pieces before being wrapped around the boy, one piece measuring 76 by 33 inches and the other 51 by 31 inches. A small section had been cut out of the smaller of the two pieces, could this have had an identifying marker on it, such as the label of an orphanage or child care organization? The blanket was sent to the Philadelphia Textile Institute, and there it was discovered that the blanket had been manufactured with a below average quality cotton thread. The blanket could have even come from a home sewing machine. The Institute was able to narrow down the places of origin to either a mill in Swannanoa, North Carolina, and or one in Granby, Quebec. When contacted, hundreds of thousands of those blankets have been shipped out between the two mills all over the U.S., so tracking down the one blanket seemed like an impossible task. Another piece of evidence located not far from the body was a men's blue corduroy cap. It still held a label on the inside for Robin's Bald Eagle Hat and Cap Company in South Philadelphia. A woman named Hannah Robbins owned the store. When detectives asked if she remembered the cap, she surprisingly said yes. She had fashioned it out of extra corduroy cloth the previous May, stating that her business would suffer profits if she wasted any extra cloth. She had been able to make 12 more hats out of the cloth. She also said that she remembered the man who bought that exact hat because he had been the only man to want an alteration to it. The cap had not originally been made with a leather strap, but the man had requested that she add one and thus remembered who he was. Hannah described the man as being in his late 20s with blonde hair and wearing work clothes. The detectives showed Hannah the photo of the boy in the box and she gasped, stating that the boy looked as if he could be the man's son. The resemblance was great. But again, as cash was the predominant method of payment, no record or contact of the man existed. 
Despite detectives canvassing the neighborhoods around Hannah's hat store and speaking with hundreds of people, the man was never found and the lead went nowhere. Other items found near the crime scene were a man's gray sweater wrapped around a dead cat, a child's tan scarf and yellow flannel shirt, and a man's white handkerchief with the initial G on it. The handkerchief had some hairs clinging to it that were compared to the boy's hairs, but sadly again no match. If any of these items held a connection to the crime, it was never established. Now on to many of the false leads that were involved with this case. Many false leads came in that could have full videos made on them alone. Some of these stories are so wild that they are truly unbelievable, and after the FBI became involved in the case, things got really bizarre. For the first time ever, state-run stores for liquor and wine posted pictures of the boy in the box in hopes to get more exposure. These types of photos had never been permitted in such retailers before this time, but this was a special case and special allowances were made. This was also a time of black and white pre-cable televisions and home landlines. There were no computers, no smartphones, and no internet. But even during this time, and with the interest of the FBI, the boy in the box was attracting national attention. This did, however, attract more false leads. Not long after Wilton Krogman, the professor of anthropology, aided the investigation, he received a phone call from a mysterious woman. She asked Krogman if he could tell whether the boy was weak-minded or not. When he asked the woman her name, she responded with, quote, do you know what it is to take care of an idiot? Sometimes you get so sick of their crying, you can kill them in a fit of anger. That might be your explanation. Then the woman hung up. Perhaps the woman knew something and called out of guilt to confess, but changed her mind in the last minute. We will never know because she never called back. Then there was a man referred to as, quote, the Good Samaritan. He had had an interesting encounter with a woman and a boy wearing raincoats along Susquehanna Road on a Sunday afternoon. There was a cold drizzle outside and the two seemed to be stranded beside their car, so the man figured they may need help changing a flat tire. When the man offered assistance, the woman told him no and rushed him away. It was only after hearing about the boy in the box on the radio that the Good Samaritan thought of the encounter. The woman had behaved as if she was hiding something, being sure to always maneuver in a way that blocked their faces from clear view, as well as their license plate. Sadly, it was too late by the time the Good Samaritan brought the matter to the police and the lead died. One evening, a Sergeant John McBride, who was working the late shift at the Philadelphia Police Homicide Department, received an interesting phone call, quote, I've had visions of killing him, the man on the other end of the line said. The boy in the box, I've had visions of killing him, I'm from Merchantville, New Jersey, but when Sergeant McBride told the man that he wanted to know more, the man hung up. He called again, though, saying, quote, If you want to hear about my visions, I'll be there tomorrow. Surprisingly, the man kept his word and showed up to the station the next day, and he confessed that he had killed the boy, but it was surely determined that the man was a psychiatric patient and innocent of the crime. Next was George Brumall, a private in the Marine Corps. He contacted police to tell them the boy in the box could be his little brother. When George was sent overseas, he lost contact with his family. The last time he had spoken with his family, he knew most of them were planning to move from Philadelphia to the West Coast, but explained that as he was one child out of 18, it was hard to keep track of everyone. Two of his younger brothers supposedly stayed behind with an older brother in Philadelphia after the rest moved but one of the two younger brothers went missing. Although there was no connection to the boy in the box, the detectives did help reunite George with his family, and they also managed to locate the missing brother, who turned out to be alive and well in California. Does anyone else picture the opening scene of Home Alone when thinking about this family, a family of 18? One lead that police did find interesting, although could not prove to be connected, was one that came from a local barber named Max Schellinger. Max had told detectives that he believed that he had cut the boy's hair just days before he was found. When Max was shown a large print of the boy's face, he was even more certain. 
He told police that the boy had come in with an older boy and that they were brothers. He remembered the boy telling him as he cut his hair that he had five brothers and a sister and that they lived in the Strawberry Mansion neighborhood. Max was so sure it had been him that he was even taken to the morgue to identify the boy, and Max confirmed it had been him. Despite the assuredness of the barber, when detectives performed a house-to-house search of the boy and his family in the Strawberry Mansion neighborhood, no such family was found, and the lead went dead. Some policemen thought this was a promising lead, while others were skeptical. Given that the haircut the boy had when he was found was so ragged and choppy, it seemed unlikely that it had been done by a proper barber. Also, unless the barber cut the boy's hair while he was naked, why were chunks of hair found on the boy's body? But some believed the boy had gotten a perfectly good haircut from the barber at first, and then was later given a poor one to prevent the boy from being recognized. Soon the search for clues reached as far as Rhode Island, and during that time, detectives became aware of a Barrington mother who had been missing along with her six-year-old son since February 19th, just around a week before the boy in the box was found in Fox Chase. Similarities between the boy's physiques meant it was a promising lead. However, it was soon established that the woman and her son were missing by choice, and she was trying to escape an abusive husband in search of a new life. A man named Richard Powell, whose name has been changed to keep his identity secret, called into the police station to report a missing person, or should I say, missing persons. Richard was 31, married, and had two little girls and a toddler. Several months before contacting police, Richard kissed his wife and said goodbye to his kids before heading to work for the day. When he arrived home later, the house was empty. His family had vanished and there had been no evidence of a struggle or foul play. It was as if they evaporated into thin air. When asked if he and his wife had been having any marital issues, Richard insisted there had been none and that he and his wife were a happily married couple. The weeks turned into months and there was still no sign of Richard's wife and kids. But when Richard heard about the boy in the box, his heart sunk. His son had a condition that kept him in a constant state of malnourishment. No matter how much good food he ate, he always appeared thin. His son would be four years old. Richard kept taking it day by day until he finally received a phone call from detectives informing him that his family had been found alive and well. His joy was cut short, however, when he was told that sadly, his wife had left on her own accord because she did not want to be married to him anymore and that she would not be returning. Then there was Joseph and Margaret Martinez and all their children from Thornton, Colorado. They were a large family with many kids, yet no one seemed to know what that number was exactly. When one of the neighbors saw one child, Raymond Martinez, pick food from an outdoor garbage can and eat it, they called police believing the child must have been starving. Police arrived at the Martinez house and spoke with Margaret, When asked about Raymond, Margaret told police that the boy who ate garbage wasn't her child and that her Raymond was in Philadelphia. Oh good, it was just another random neighborhood boy eating garbage. Believing children were in danger, police let themselves in to look around the house. There was evidence children had been around but were perhaps now hiding from fear. Lo and behold, the police officers found Raymond hiding under a bed. He weighed only 36 pounds. Soon, more children started to emerge from their hiding spots, totaling eight kids. However, most of the children appeared to be well-fed and healthy, unlike Raymond. When police spoke to Joseph Martinez, who worked day in and day out to support the family, he told them that Margaret was in and out of the hospital for mental reasons and that she was unwell. When asked about Raymond's condition, Joseph told police that he didn't know why, but that Margaret had hated four of the children from birth and neglected them. He also told police that he hadn't seen Rose, their three-year-old, in a while. When Margaret was asked where Rose was, she lied to police telling them that she was in Philadelphia with relatives. When this was proven to be a lie, she told them, quote, She got sick. I put her in a garbage can after she died. Just try and find her. 
There was never any connection between the Martinez family and the boy in the box. And around this time, Mary Jane Barker, the little girl that disappeared late February 1957, the one that Frederick Benosis heard about on the radio prompting him to call police about finding the boy in the box, was eventually discovered. Her body had been found in a vacant house not far from her own home. She had been exploring and had accidentally shut herself into an empty closet, and with no way to open the closet from within, she heartbreakingly died of thirst and starvation. Then there was Irene and Kenneth Dudley. Police were drawn to them after one of their children, a little girl, was also found dead in the woods wrapped in a blanket. She had starved to death and had a broken leg. What really caught investigators' eyes was that this girl was wearing clothes from J.C. Penney, and they thought there could be some connection. It was a promising lead, too, as it had been rumored some of the other Dudley children had been missing as well. The Dudleys were, quote, a nomadic carnival couple, living in Syracuse, New York. The couple had been flagged suspicious after a Syracuse citizen notified police of their odd behavior at a truck stop, saying they looked like they had something to hide. As the couple was always out of work, they would travel around the U.S. following carnivals, hoping for some kind of employment. But this never led to steady income, and the family struggled to feed their little girl, who was named Carol Ann. Perhaps it was out of guilt, ignorance, or even just exhaustion, but when the Dudleys were questioned by police, they came clean. Entirely clean. As it turns out, the Dudleys had had many, many other children throughout their relationship, which also met similar fates to Carol Ann. We had to leave them, quote Kenneth Dudley. There were just so many. By their own account, one child had been left in a wood, one child left in a lake in Arkansas, one child in an old phosphate mine, and one child even buried in their backyard in Syracuse. Although there had been 10 Dudley children, and they had all been alive at different times throughout the Dudley's relationship, six of which had died due to extreme negligence, but none of which turned out to be the boy in the box. Over the many years, the boy in the box's case began to run cold, but one man always kept it alive. Remington Bristow, just the most detective name I've ever heard. Remington Bristow had been assigned to the case early on, and it had begun to take over his life. Remington was 35 at the time the boy was found. He was a classic kind of man who liked steak and potatoes, smoked Lucky Strike cigarettes, and drank scotch on the rocks. Despite his cool demeanor, he was a loving family man. He loved his wife and children and all kids in general. He studied mortuary sciences in Los Angeles, served in the Navy during World War II, and then came home to open his own funeral business just before joining the medical examiner's office during the 1950s. He is attributed to being the predominant reason the case still exists in our minds today. He had never been able to shake this case from his mind. It was in his thoughts on vacation, at night in bed, or while working on other cases. It was the stereotypical white whale case that all detectives are said to have at least one of in their careers. Remington was always looking for connections within other cases to the boy in the box. He always carried the case with him, and he was always willing to entertain even the silliest of leads. A mold of the boy's face had also been made, and yes, he carried that around with him at all times as well. The same questions always plagued him. Why were the boy's arms folded? Why was his hair cut? Why had he been loved enough to be given surgery, but not a proper burial? On one vacation to Mexico with his wife, the pair had been just walking down a road in a small town when the idea hit him. What if the boy had been raised a girl? If he had been, that would explain why no one could identify him after the haircut. Could that have been why his eyebrows had been styled? Had his hair been cut in order to keep him from being recognized? So right at that moment, while in the small town in Mexico, Remington found a street artist, took out the autopsy photos that he always kept with him, and asked the sketch artist to draw the boy as a girl, with long hair. 
And yes, to answer your question, the sketch artist did recoil in horror upon seeing the boy's autopsy photo. He must have thought Remington was mad. Given that Remington spoke little Spanish, it took some time for the artist to understand why this awful picture was being waved in front of his face, but eventually they came to an understanding. Remington's theory that the boy had been raised as a girl was never proven to be true. However, it was never proven untrue, and it remains a possibility. By now, several years had passed since the boy in the box had been found, and the lead stopped, for the most part, coming in. Remington, still determined to find the boy's identity, turned to a parapsychologist that dealt in extrasensory perception named Florence Sternfeld. Florence was not just anyone from off the streets. She came highly recommended from Carol Nash, director of parapsychology at St. Joseph's College in Philadelphia, and the first American to win the William McDougall Award for distinguished work in his field. Carol truly believed Florence had been, quote, endowed with powers of ESP. Florence had also already been commissioned for assistance by the New Jersey police in some of their cases and came recommended by them as well, although for obvious reasons, these things are never publicized. Remington sat down with Florence in her home to get her input. He had been required to bring something metal from the case for her to hold, and the only items he was able to bring were the staples taken from the box the boy had been found in. They were the only metal items involved in the case. He also handed her a piece of the blanket the boy had been wrapped in. What Florence saw stayed with Remington for the rest of his life and led to his primary theory on what happened to the boy in the box. Florence told Remington to look for, quote, a big house with a wooden railing. I see four steps and there's a log cabin. There's children playing inside. And I see a street, fourth house on the corner, There's a candy store on the corner and an old man behind the counter. There was a long silence before Florence continued, quote, I see a short husky man. He has fat fingers. He has a scar with an unusual shape. He's a non-professional type. I mean, he works with his hands, but I sense that he doesn't hold a job for very long. He drinks, sometimes too much. There are other children in the family. His wife was aware that he killed the boy. The man was sorry, very sorry, and afraid. He put the boy in the box and hid it, meaning to come back later to bury it, but the body was found before he could do it. And with that, Florence saw no more. Remington thanked her and left. He went about his life for some time until one day, driving down a small road of row houses in Fox Chase, he spotted a candy store at the corner of the road. As he parked his car and got out, he saw an old man behind the counter through the front store windows. Remembering that Florence told him to check out the fourth house from the corner, he went to the door and rang the doorbell. There was no answer. He sat and waited a while, but no one came home. So Remington knocked on neighbors' doors until someone finally answered. The couple that answered the door had not been acquainted with the occupants of the fourth house, but mentioned that they had moved into the house about the same time, which just happened to be a couple days before the boy in the box had been found and not far from the street. The couple did say that they saw the family that moved out of the fourth house, a nice family, two kids, a little girl and a little boy, both kindergarten age, and the nice dog too. If there had been any connection between this family and the boy in the box, it was never found and was ruled out as a strong possibility given that the blanket the boy was found in had no dog hairs on it. Surely there would have been some. But soon Remington got an even bigger lead following Florence's predictions, one that would take over his life. Several weeks after that, Remington was at home reading the paper when he saw an ad for an auction scheduled at the house on Morandon Road. The name rang a bell in his head. The house belonged to Arthur and Catherine Nicoletti, who used it to run a foster care business but were now getting out of the industry. They also had a daughter from Catherine's previous marriage named Anna Marie Nagel, who had given birth to four children out of wedlock. Three had been stillborn, and the fourth had died in a freak accident when the boy had been electrocuted by a mechanical pony ride. 
The Nicoletti's foster home had been investigated by police doing a head count just after the boy in the box was found in 1957 during the many investigations into foster care homes in the area. All children had been accounted for. However, years after the boy was found, one of the residents who had stayed in the house as a foster child when he was seven and eight years old, wrote to police telling them that there was one boy not accounted for, who was not a foster child and was always running around while being taken care of by Anna Marie. Was this another child of hers that they didn't know about? Another child out of wedlock that they had tried to keep secret? It was never established at the time, despite the boy being the same age as the boy in the box. Remington had always wished there had been a follow-up on this lead, but sadly there never was. Now, seeing the ad in the paper, Remington decided to go check out the house before the auction started and look around. The Nicolettis were no longer living in the house, but there were some private security guards out front letting people in who wanted to look over the items ahead of time. As Remington walked inside, he concluded that the Nicolettis had been pack rats. There was stuff everywhere, dressers, tables, chairs, furniture covered with sheets, and broken furniture. He made his way up to the attic and looked out at the backyard through one of the windows, which had begun to yellow with age. He noticed through the blankets and towels that swayed back and forth on the clothesline, a log cabin located near a little pond. He went to investigate the cabin excitement building up in him. He went out the back door and into the backyard. When he glanced inside the cabin, he saw a makeshift jungle gym. There were ropes to climb and an old maze to run and crawl through. It had definitely been a cabin made for children to play in. Had Florence seen this cabin in her visions? She had told Remington, quote, and there's a log cabin and there's children playing inside. There were scuff marks on the floor of the cabin as well, from cots perhaps? Had the cabin doubled as a sleeping quarters during busier months for the Nicolettis, or during the warmer season to get the children out of the house for a bit? Where would a child use the washroom if he needed to pee? The pond? Maybe this cabin only slept boys. Remington pictured a sleepy, undernourished boy stumble to the pond in the middle of the night to urinate. Could he have slipped and fallen? hitting his head on the rocks, lying unconscious with one hand and one foot in the water, causing the washerwoman effect. When Remington turned around, he looked up at the windows on the third floor of the house. What if the boy had fallen out of one of those windows and that was what caused all the bruises on his face? Perhaps dazed and disoriented, he walked in the night and tripped and fell beside the pond, dying beside it with one hand and one foot in the water. There were many possibilities and no proof. This could still all just be conjecture, but when Remington went to walk back into the house through the laundry, he noticed that the blankets on the clotheslines were cut in half, just as the one that the boy in the box was wrapped in. Was this to make the blankets smaller to fit all the children's cots better? Before Remington left the Nicoletti's house, he decided to take a peek into the basement just as he had seen enough, he noticed a bassinet tucked in a corner covered in dust. It was a white bassinet. He thought it was odd because the Nicolettis didn't take in babies at their foster care. Who would it have been used for? Anna Marie? There were still so many questions and so few answers. Sadly, Remington's companions at the department didn't share his excitement in the Nicoletti lead. It sounded more to them that Remington had contrived a narrative to fit what he had been looking for, as well as one that resembled what Florence had described to him. They questioned why his hair had been cut. Why, if the boy had died by accident, hadn't the police been called? Why had none of the other children living there come forward, as surely someone would have seen something? Although there was skepticism in Remington's theory, it also couldn't be unproven. But Remington was never able to sit down with the Nicolettis for an interview around this time. Apparently, they were never available, and Remington couldn't pin them down, or perhaps they were avoiding the police at all costs. Interestingly, however, in 1984, Remington was able to locate a man that had been a foster child at the Nicolettis in 1957 and had been interviewed by police at that time. 
When asked in 1984 if he remembered any other boy in the home resembling the boy in the box's description, the man said no. He described his experience, quote, You know, we were treated pretty good there, all things considered, but they sure gave lousy haircuts. Remington confirmed, quote, They cut the kid's hair? The man told him, yes, anything to save a dollar. Eventually, over the years, the Nicolettis were approached by police trying to get an interview with them. They refused to talk on the grounds that they knew nothing and were being harassed. Remington tried again by phone to see if Arthur would take a polygraph, but was hung up on. In 1998, the case was revisited once again, but sadly, not by Remington, who had passed away five years earlier in 1993. Many of his theories about the case remain popular today. Now, DNA testing was common practice in criminal cases, and a detective named Tom Augustine was ordered to revisit the cold case. There was a chance that some hair had been saved by the medical examiner back in 1957 from the boy in the box, and with luck, it might have DNA on it to compare. The hard part, however, was to find a way to get Anna Marie Nagel's DNA to test against it. After tracking down Arthur Nicoletti once again, Tom visited him at his house to see if he knew where Anna Marie was, and he sure did. Arthur's wife Catherine had passed away, but he had married Anna Marie, his stepdaughter by Catherine, a few months back. Anna was there at the house and spoke briefly to Tom, recounting what had happened to her children who had died, the youngest having been electrocuted on the electrical pony ride. When Tom asked if she would be willing to supply a sample of her DNA, Arthur forbid it, and at that, Tom was told to leave. Tom got the feeling that they were trying to hide something, but was not able to pursue the matter further. It wouldn't be until 2007 that a judge finally agreed there was enough evidence to allow a DNA sample to be collected from Anna Marie Nagel Nicoletti. By this time, she was an elderly woman living in a nursing home, Arthur had passed away some time ago, and her mind wasn't what it used to be. The nurse at the nursing home quickly gathered a few swabs of Anna's saliva, and at that, the detectives never saw Anna again. It wasn't until October of that year that the results came back and determined Anna was not the mother of the boy in the box. The unmatching DNA evidence was only made possible to get because of a group called the Vidux Society. Founded in 1990, they are a group, quote, where like-minded persons, both in and outside of the field of forensics, could gather to discuss and debate crimes and mysteries. Comprised of law enforcement, forensic experts, and other diverse professional backgrounds, the VDUX Society looks into cold cases with fresh eyes and new opinions, quote, they do not get paid, nor do they have authority, What they do have, collectively, is centuries of experience in investigating crime. In 1998, when the case was 41 years old and the VDUX Society had 82 members, they decided to look into the case of the boy in the box. They were able to obtain a court order for exhumation of the boy's body in hopes that new advances in medical science could help give the boy an identity. Due to the state the remains were in, there was a probable chance that mitochondrial DNA could still be extracted over nuclear DNA. Nuclear DNA is inherited by both parents, while mitochondrial DNA is passed on by the mother only and is easier to extract from bones, hair, or teeth. From a tooth taken from the boy in the box, mitochondrial DNA was obtained and a newfound optimism towards the case was felt by many, especially after 41 years. Sadly, nine years after the exhumation of the boy in the box, the incompatibility of Anna's DNA to his created a sense of hopelessness once again. The boy in the box was reburied, but this time in a prominent spot in the Ivy Hill Cemetery and given the name America's Unknown Child. Another lead that was investigated took place in 1965, when Bill Kelly, lead investigator for the Philadelphia Police Identification Unit and a detective assigned to the Boy in the Box case, decided to do some spring cleaning in his house of old magazines and newspapers. When he picked up a newspaper from late 1956, his heart stopped. 
There was an article about large amounts of Hungarian refugees coming to the U.S. after the anti-Soviet revolution, accompanied by a photo of some of the refugees. One of them, Bill, was certain was the boy in the box. If the boy had been from Hungary, it would explain why no one, not even medical experts, had come forward to identify the boy, as none of his medical records would be in the U.S., Bill contacted the Immigration and Naturalization Services immediately. He wanted to look through all the passport photos of Hungarian boys that immigrated to the U.S. around that time, but to his dismay, there were 15,000 of them. But he wasn't discouraged. After looking through more than 11,000 photos, Bill eventually found the one he believed to be from the newspaper and the boy in the box. The boy from the photo was eventually located alive and well, however, after having been adopted by a nice American family. Although Bill was happy for the Hungarian boy, he was sad for the boy in the box. He had been so hopeful and sure it was him. In February 2000, that hopefulness was restored in the case again, and it all started with a phone call. It would lead to one of the most debated theories about this case ever investigated. It was the exact day of the 43rd anniversary of the discovery of the boy in the box when the phone rang at the Philadelphia Police Department. A psychiatrist was calling in regard to one of his patients, a middle-aged woman who had confessed a burden plaguing her for years. A little boy had been killed in her childhood home and she couldn't hold on to the guilt any longer. The woman wanted to speak with police but was extremely apprehensive, so she got her psychiatrist to call on her behalf. It would take two years of back and forth communications to convince the woman of finally opening up about her experience, and she would only do so within the familiar setting of her psychiatrist's room. Tom Augustine was one of three detectives present at the confessional that day in 2002 and noticed the woman's appearance. She was, quote, tall with a strong face and dark, intelligent eyes. She is not so much handsome as striking. Most striking of all are her shoulders. Few men have shoulders so wide. Some of the women who do are world-class athletes. She is referred to as either Mary, Martha, or just M for secrecy's sake. And I will refer to her as Mary from now on. Mary was a scientist with a doctorate in chemistry who worked for one of the largest drug companies in the world, and due to her educational intelligence, she seemed competent and credible. Her parents had been educators, her father a teacher and her mother a librarian, and were very liked by their students and community. Their pictures could be found in hundreds of yearbooks smiling and laughing with the students and faculty. But Mary's parents had a dark secret, one that only took place from behind closed doors. Quote, My parents did not have normal sexual desires. My father molested me. My mother didn't just silently let it happen, which is the usual scenario. She was enthusiastic about it, even joined in. The agreement was that my father let her indulge her taste in little boys. She preferred them to adult men because she thought them purer somehow. Mary then told the detectives about the day the boy in the box came into their lives. She had been 13 years old when her mother had driven her to a weird neighborhood and told her to wait in the car as she went to the house and knocked on the front door. Mary said she remembered the houses were so close together and so close to the street that she could hear the conversation between her mother and the woman in the door from the car. Mary saw the woman in the house hand her mother a baby before asking her, quote, did you get the money? And watching her mother hand over an envelope from her purse. Their interaction had only been a few minutes before her mother returned to the car and gave the baby to Mary to hold so she could drive home. Mary said she distinctly remembered the boy's diaper was dirty and smelled of urine, but that she didn't mind holding him. She felt sorry for him and immediately formed a bond with the little baby. She said even after all these decades, she remembered how it felt to hold this baby, as she had never held a baby before. Mary asked her mother why they were taking the baby home, and her mother just responded, quote, because he needs a place. 
The boy was named Jonathan from then on, and although the mother had adopted him, he was not treated like a normal child. He was immediately kept in the basement, quote, As soon as we got home, my mother took him down to the basement and put him in this little room that used to be a coal bin. My mom took some blankets and some heavy dishes, like dog dishes, down to the basement. Don't you go down there, I remember her saying. I was afraid to anyhow. Jonathan had been given a large cardboard box as a mattress, one that held a refrigerator, and Mary's mother would take food down to him, but never her father. Jonathan didn't ever speak, quote, All the time he was with us, he never said a word, not a word. Mary told about how she would sneak down to the basement to visit Jonathan. She said she remembered the smell vividly. It was so strong. The drain in the middle of the tiny basement room was his only toilet. Once a week, Jonathan was given a bath. He would splash around and make funny noises, but never speak. Mary said that she had always been hungry growing up, despite there being enough money for food. Her parents had good jobs, but were frugal, and Jonathan had to have been starving all the time. As years went by, Mary would spend some time in the basement with Jonathan and take his food to him. He never went outside and never had friends, just her. Mary said Jonathan was always covered in coal dust and it would make her mother mad because she had to then bathe him. Jonathan's hair had never been cut and by this time had grown long. It was always messy and dirty. The night in question happened late in February 1957, Mary recalled. Her mother had made baked beans for dinner and had taken some down to Jonathan. Mary remembers specifically hearing her mother saying that Jonathan was going to get a bath that evening because there was no school or work the next day. After Mary's mother had gone down to get Jonathan a little while later, Mary remembers hearing cursing and stomping from the basement as her mother dragged Jonathan upstairs. She was very mad, quote, She made him sit on the bathroom floor as the tub was filling. Back and forth he rocked, making that little moaning sound. He looked so pathetic, too old for a diaper, all these years later. Mary was then ordered to cut Jonathan's fingernails. She remembers they were very dirty. Next, Mary's mother picked Jonathan up and placed him into the water. He let out a scream because the water was too hot and kicked and splashed, getting Mary's mother wet. Mary's mother screamed at him, quote, That's enough! That's enough! But Jonathan didn't stop and was soon crying as well. Mary's mother, angrier now, yelled at him again before putting him back into the tub, quote, Back into the tub he went. He didn't scream this time. Maybe the water was cool enough, or maybe he was afraid. This was when Jonathan threw up. He threw up black beans into the bath water. Mary recalls her mother letting out a shriek, a sound she had never heard her mother make before. Jonathan was then pulled out of the bath and hit across the face, which made him cry more which made the beatings worse. Mary said it was at that time that her mother lost it and slapped Jonathan so hard that he fell and hit his head on the floor, making a loud thudding sound. But the beating continued and Mary's mother slapped him and hit him again and again. According to Mary, she was then ordered out of the bathroom. She ran to her room but stood in the doorway listening, quote, I stood in the doorway because I wanted to hear. I heard splashing noises and a loud thud. I knew she'd thrown him back into the tub. Wake up, wake up, my mother hollered. Nothing, just silence. Jonathan, I want you to wake up right now. Come on. Mary then heard her father go and check on the situation. She didn't want to get in trouble, so she ran back to her bed and hid under the covers, but could still hear them talking nervously together. Eventually, Mary slept waking intermittently to the sounds. She heard the bathwater drain and talking in the hallway, followed by the sound of scissors cutting. And when she woke the next morning, she found Jonathan's hair all over the bathroom floor. Mary remembers her mother picking up Jonathan, who had passed away by this point, and wrapping him in a blanket. She had red eyes from crying. She then carried Jonathan downstairs to the basement where there was a back door that led to the driveway. It was raining and Mary remembers grabbing her raincoat before getting into the car with her mother and Jonathan's body in the trunk. They drove for a while before Mary's mother stopped the car on a quiet road by a small thicket of trees. 
They got out and went to the back of the car to retrieve Jonathan. A car became visible in the distance driving towards them. Mary and her mother avoided facing him, keeping their back to the car that now had pulled up beside them. He must have seen their trunk door open and suspected them of littering, quote, Please don't dump trash here. This is my neighborhood, the man in the car told them. Then a pause. All the while, their backs were still to him. Quote, Do you need help? Do you have a flat? Mary's mother shook her head no. Okay, if you're sure. If you're sure you're okay, he replied before leaving. After the man left, they took Jonathan, still wrapped in the blanket, out of the trunk and into the woods. It is believed that the man who stopped was in fact the Good Samaritan that reported their suspicious activity to the police back in 1957. Mary's mother spotted a box and laid Jonathan inside out of the rain. Then they left. They stopped off at a diner for a bite to eat before heading back home and pretending everything was normal and fine. It had taken Mary three hours to tell her story to detectives. After the story got around, most people believed it was the real deal. Other people thought that Mary was over attention or was unwell. I will start with the facts that support Mary's story, then go on to points that suggest its fabrication. Evidence to support. The Good Samaritan's testimony matched Mary's testimony. When the Good Samaritan spoke with police back in 1957, he mentioned he saw a boy wearing a raincoat and his mother by the trunk of their car but never saw their faces. This is also confirmed by Mary as she claims she wore a raincoat that morning and considered Mary had such broad shoulders, it is believed that she was easily mistaken for a boy from behind. The brown residue found in the boy's esophagus matches the story that he threw up baked beans shortly before he died. This was also a fact that hadn't been highly publicized. The body of the boy was found wrapped in a blanket, just as Mary had said. Mary had been ordered to cut the boy's nails, and she discovered he had been given a haircut after she woke the following morning. Considering the boy would have been naked and damp at the time he had his hair cut, it would make sense why hair was still found clung to his body. In living with Mary and her family, the boy had indeed been malnourished for years. The layout of Mary's house was exactly how she had described it in her story. Detectives were granted access to Mary's house years later to investigate the legitimacy of it, and everything was as she had described, down to the drain in the basement and the back door leading to the driveway. Mary's story was consistent over 13 years as claimed by her psychiatrist. Mary was well-educated and showed a high level of intelligence. When she told her story, she seemed to truly relive the horror of it and feel genuine emotions of guilt and sadness. Now, evidence to disprove the theory. The narrative that the little boy was kept as a sex slave while being filthy, smelly, and malnourished by two pedophile parents in the education field is hard to believe. Also, the fact that both parents were eager and willing to fulfill the other's sexual perversions along with their own in a pedophilic agreement seems outlandish. Neighbors and friends of the family interviewed after the fact never recalled her parents being odd or suspicious in any way, and friends of the family who had visited the house never remembered ever hearing or seeing a little boy. Mary had said that Jonathan never spoke, but surely some evidence that he was there would eventually be found. Can a little boy truly go unnoticed from the whole world? The boy in the box case had been in the news for decades prior to Mary deciding to come forward. She could have gotten much of her information from the papers and filled in the narrative to fit the details. Mary saw a psychiatrist for over a decade. Her history of mental illness made police skeptical of her credibility. A very odd fact is that her psychiatrist had not taken any notes in the 13 years of Mary recounting her story to him. When asked by detectives why he didn't have so much as a post-it with writings on it, he claimed his job is to heal, not engage in journalism. Therefore, he is not required to take notes. Mary's testimony does match that of the Good Samaritan's testimony, but his was made public back in 1957. Again, she could have taken it and filled in the blanks to fit her own narrative. She was also probably very aware of her physical stature and knew that she could pass as a boy from behind. 
Therefore, the Good Samaritan, claiming he saw a boy and his mother, was not a point of contention for Mary. DNA testing would not be useful to prove or disprove Mary's story as Mary claimed Jonathan was not her biological brother. Some found this convenient and the claim that the boy was purchased like a commodity too unbelievable. To this date, Mary's story cannot be proven or disproven, but remains a popular scenario to what happened to the boy in the box. Today, the boy is buried in Ivy Hill Cemetery and Crematory in Philadelphia. His original burial was in Potter's Field with a stone marker reading, Heavenly Father, bless this unknown child. In fact, after no one came forward to claim the boy back in the 50s, detectives working on the case pooled money together and paid for the boy's funeral themselves. After the VDOC Society exhumed the body and reburied him in Ivy Hill, a new marker was placed that read, America's Unknown Child. The coffin, headstone, and funeral were all provided and donated by the son of one of the detectives that buried the boy in 1957, a bench the VDOC Society donated, as well as the original markers hid next to the grave. The community still to this day adorn his grave with flowers, toys, and stuffed animals. The boy in the box was never given the love he deserved during his short life, but in death piqued a deep curiosity and adoration that has spanned over four decades and beyond. I hope you enjoyed this video and the heartbreaking story of America's Unknown Child. I would love to hear your theories and thoughts on this case in the comments below, or do you have any new theories not covered? Put them down. We all want to hear them. This channel is written, researched, and edited by me alone. So if you enjoyed this video, please help a girl out and hit the thumbs up button, subscribe, and share it. If you have any suggestions for cases you want covered, please send me an email. I also have a new Instagram account, somethingwicked underscore TC, so be sure to check that out as well. Thank you so much for all of your wonderful support. I hope you found this case as gripping as I did. My name is Jacqueline, and I will see you again in the next video. Bye.